Good evening, Internet. Uh, Lord Malachite has decided to broadcast again after a very long hiatus. I, I took close to two months off. Uh, I stopped doing these videos because new episodes of Star vs. stopped premiering, and uh, I'm a little bit behind because of that. Since there's been either two or four episodes I had left undone, depending on whether you want to count the in, them as individual 11-minute increments or not. Now, of course, we have new episodes coming out this week. So I am uh, going to go back in time a little bit here, about you know a few weeks, and, and tackle some of these issues from these older episodes. I do want to get to other things, but I just... Uh, I just went through a lazy streak. I have fallen behind at writing, fallen behind at gaming, fallen behind at making these videos, and in general, I was just very depressed about my unemployment. Uh, but I am working again as of the time of this broadcast today. It's a job I really don't want to be at, but I'm hoping to only be there for a short time. Uh, so anyway, uh, enough about silly things about myself. I want to talk a bit about uh, one of the more controversial episodes uh, from Season 2 of Star Versus, and that would be Starstruck, uh, the next one that I have yet to tackle in the, this season. Uh, Starstruck, uh, let's just get the credits out of the way right away, uh, had many hands in its story design. Uh, so we had the usual Dominic Bisignano and Aaron Hammersley uh, were involved in the writing of the actual story, as well as the series creator Darren Nefsey herself and uh, another writer named Susie Vlachek. Now, again, for those of you just joining us or who aren't familiar with it, uh, being a story writer is very different than being an actual writer. So when you get a story writing credit, what that means is that you contributed something to this episode. It could have been uh, helping to develop the main plot line. It could have been a side plot. It could have been that you just wanted to add in this little thing or joke or something about a character. But whatever you contributed was enough to actually get you a story credit. This is different than the actual writer credit credit. The story writers do not actually write out the individual lines and scenes and stuff like that. It's more like they're putting things into the pot of ideas. So in this case, you know, a story writing credit could have been the person whose true idea it was to have Star meet essentially a uh, homage to Sailor Moon, uh, which is basically what Meet a Love Berry is. Let's uh, let's not kid ourselves. The whole series it really lends itself as kind of a parody of Sailor Moon. It's very different uh, in many different way different ways, which I'll discuss as we get into this episode. But the overall theme of a fourteen year old girl who's, you know, she's a little bit touched, she's blonde, but uh, this, not to feed into stereotypes or anything, but Star is just very different. Now, she's not a crybaby like Usagi was in Sailor Moon, uh, but she is just kind of a different person. She's more of an unlikely hero. She is the kind of girl who just likes to have fun, uh, but she certainly is not one who's going to shy away from a fight. Uh, so, and of course she has her uh, magic wand, which looks very much uh, like many of uh, Usagi's or Sailor Moon's uh, wands of the, that she's carried throughout the years. Specifically, it looks a lot like her one from Sailor Moon R, especially with the upgrade that it received at the end of Season 1. But there's not a real reason to get into that too much. These are just minor homages. It's not like they're trying to rip it off or trying to draw some kind of parallel. So enough is said about that. So the entire um, episode itself, as far as the actual writer, the person who writes out the individual scenes and comes up with the dialogue and stuff like that, the writer and storyboarding uh, fell to one specific credit, a fellow named Tyler Chen. Uh, so we'll get into his work on this a little bit. And, of course, the directors of this episode were Dominic Bisignano and Aaron Hammersley themselves. Those two seems to have the most involvement with the actual production of the series. Uh, certainly, we're not trying to uh, say anything bad about Darren, that she's lazy or that she's uh, not doing her work or anything. She was the creator of the series. She has the, she has the vision, and she has been involved a lot more in the actual story ideas and stuff in this season than she was in season one, at least according to what we know from the credits. You know, again, I don't work on the show. I don't have behind the scenes access, so I'm not trying to start any rumors or anything like that. I'm going with purely what we're being told by the official credits for these things. So jumping into the episode, how I felt about this, I've watched Starstruck several times, and each time I like it a little bit better. And I can tell you that the first time I watched it, I really, really did not like it. Uh, I felt that we were going back to a stupid star again, doing 
dumb things. And uh, as you know from watching my videos, unless this is your first one, I really have a problem with the dumbing down of Star's character in Season 2. She was never dumb. Now, uh, I use this phrase a lot, and I'll use it again here for those of you just joining us. Star is not stupid. Uh, now, I would definitely say that she's impulsive and that she is uh, naive. Th those are two things that definitely, definitely uh, ring true about her. She's impulsive. She's, na she's naive. She doesn't think things through, through all the time. But that doesn't mean that she's dumb. And many of the things that happen in season two just make her come off as being dumb rather than impatient and impulsive and naive. Uh, and there is some of that in this episode. However, uh, rather than just rant and rave that Star blindly follows Mina Loveberry around and doesn't take the time to question what Mina's doing until she's practically forced to at the point of a gun at the climax of the, of the episode, uh, I want to step back and think think a little more closely about what we learned in this episode. On its surface, it's just a dumb episode with a new, possibly one-off character coming in. Star has hero worship for her because she's supposedly one of Muni's greatest warriors and just blindly does whatever Mina tells her to do. They wreak havoc throughout the uh, Echo Creek Park, and eventually Mina tries to essentially take over the world, which is... I don't even know where to begin with that. So, but eventually Star has to make her choice and she realizes that Mina is apparently just crazy and maybe she shouldn't be worshiping her as a hero so much and Mina essentially goes away. Uh, that's the episode in a nutshell. Of course, there's many gags, some good, some bad. There's, uh, there is some good things with Marco. There's some interesting uh, little observations about uh, living in America and the way we vote for things, majority rules, uh, and the way we'll blindly follow certain leaders and things like that. And to be honest, considering the fact that our nation is uh, trying to choose between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, two of the worst human beings that I can possibly think of, uh, yeah, I would say the show's pretty much hitting the nail on the head uh, right there. I'm, I'm not going to turn this into a political debate. I really couldn't care less who you support in the election. I personally will never uh, vote for either of those two clowns, but, you know, that's just me. If you feel uh, empowered to vote for one of them, that that's fine. I'm not here to give you a political speech. So moving on from that. Let's talk a bit more about what this episode has actually brought to the table. If we take it at more than just face value and we start to really think about the character of Mina Loveberry, uh, we can see the homages to Sailor Moon and her design. She has the Odangos in her hair, the uh, those of you familiar with the Sailor Moon dub, the, the meatballs or meat buns, she has the uh, the extremely long pigtails, although her hair is purple and uh, not blonde since Star is already blonde. Uh, and she has the little uh, rabbit earrings, uh, the rabbit being the Usagi symbol because, of course, in Japanese, Usagi means rabbit. So that was a very prevalent uh, thing that we saw throughout the Sailor Moon anime and manga. So with this character, who is apparently just completely off her rocker and just doing all this insane stuff, I started to step back and think that maybe there was more of a reason behind it. Maybe it's more than just uh, coming up with some cheap jokes and silly ways to do things. What if there's a method to the madness? And I'm not referring to the method of uh, Mina's alleged bid to essentially take over the Earth that appears at the climax of this episode. I, I'm thinking more in the terms of what's happening in Muni and other dimensions. Uh, one character that we haven't seen hide nor hair of uh, is Hainus, uh, the headmistress of St. Olga's Reform School for Wayward Princesses. We, we were introduced to her uh, in Season 1, Episode 10, and she has not been seen since. The last we saw of her is that finding the uh, the hairpin uh, that Marco that Marco dropped, she uses metallurgy to determine that it comes from Earth, and then she knows that uh, the quote unquote princesses that thwarted her and started the started the revolt in her school uh, come from Earth, and that's all we know. We don't know anything else about what's going on. We don't exactly know what Hanus's major plan is. We don't know if she's coming to Earth or what. We just know that she discovered this crucial fact of information, and she was never mentioned or seen again. 
Now, what we can extrapolate from that episode and the way that Hainis does things is that she completely destroys any princess's individuality. She basically forces them to conform, to conform into a very tight mold, and she reprograms them in her little solitary reconformment chamber and turns them into what she wants them to be. Uh, this was, of course, an homage to the classic film A Clockwork Orange, which uh, if you have not seen it, you definitely should because they make some uh, great visual uh, references in that, that infamous scene where Marco is in the chair. Uh, but more importantly, digging deeper into this, uh, we can also see take a little uh, crossover from uh, one of the late Gravity Falls episodes. It wasn't a terribly important one, uh, but it's when, when Stan Pines, uh, when Stan Lee Pines, I should say, runs for uh, mayor of Gravity Falls, uh, the, the Stan Turian candidate. Now, this that of title, of course, uh, being a play on the uh, important movie, The Manchurian Candidate. And for those not in the know, uh, what that actually means, a Manchurian candidate, uh, the plot of the film is that you have a candidate groom to run for the president of the United States, and he's been hypnotically trained. So if like a very specific phrase is said, he then can basically be utterly controlled and made to do whatever uh, the small group of people want. So it's like a, a way of planting uh, a spot, you know, this complete and total spy and puppet at the head of the free world. Now, obviously, it was much uh, less of a serious thing in the Stanturian candidate. They were just using a tie to make Stan do what they wanted him to say to be elected. Uh, there really wasn't that much malicious going on with it. But what I'm digging at here is this may be what Hainis is, in fact, doing, creating a little army of Manchurian princesses. She takes these quote-unquote wayward princesses that their parents don't want to deal with, and she turns them into these perfect ideal girls that are supposedly wanted and sends them back home. And she's building herself an army. Uh, more importantly than really than building an army, she's building herself an end to those kingdoms. Uh, if we stop and think about it, any princess that was at St. Olga's under uh, Hainus and reprogrammed by her and goes back home, the, uh, Hainus could very easily have some kind of code word that would allow her to simply march into those kingdoms and take them over because the program princess will then essentially open the gates and do whatever is necessary. And she could be doing this on a major intergalactic level. We know she's certainly dealing with different dimensions and that royalty from uh, all over the universe seems to send their uh, wayward and individual princesses to this school specifically. Uh, so one of the things that I've been working on uh, with Synchronous, a good friend of mine here online, is some theories about Mina, and maybe she really isn't this totally crazy person, or at least she wasn't always. Star was always very, very fond of Mina. She's supposed to be one of the greatest heroes that Mina's ever had. And my current working theory is that Star is actually correct about this, that Mina was a great hero of Muni, that she did a lot of good things. Somewhere along the line, she must have crossed Hainus and been captured. And Hainus attempted to reprogram uh, uh, Mina in, just like she does with all the other princesses entrusted to her. Mina, being a warrior and being strong, simply did not submit to this. Uh, but having uh, being subjected to these uh, reprogram reprogramming over and over and over again, uh, what Mina eventually had to do in order to not allow Hainus to win, to not become a puppet of her, was to essentially open the door of insanity. She allowed herself to go insane and essentially allowed her mind to be broken to keep herself from becoming a pawn of Hainus. Uh, then, then Mina was essentially kicked out into the world by Hainus, and who knows what she's been doing since then, since she's effectively insane and didn't fit in with what Hainus was looking to create. One of the key things that has uh, brought us to consider this idea is how uh, early in the episode, when Star and Marco actually meet Mina, Mina states that she is living on Earth at the time, she's vacationing on Earth as per the orders of her doctor. 
Uh, now, we know from what we've seen of the show that Muni does not seem to have any doctors. They don't really have anything in the way of medicine. And Star described psychology on Muni as essentially being thrown into a, put into a catapult and launched. Muni is an extremely primitive place. They don't even have anything like indoor plumbing. They don't have medicine. Uh, they don't have any kind of modern sciences. I mean, they, they eat corn. They thrive on corn, for goodness sakes, So, which is a nutritionally useless substance for the most part. So there are many things that make Earth superior to Muni, despite the fact that Muni actually has uh, magic, or probably the biggest thing that Earth, Earth lacks in that sense. So what I'm currently hypothesizing is that Mina is a much more important character than we're led to believe. Now, I could be totally wet about all this. I could just be trying uh, to add things in that aren't really there, and that's very certainly possible. I'm not trying to chip all this into stone. I'm certainly not trying to say that this is what it is or that I have some kind of inside track and know things. But this is what I'm going with based on the little things that we already know and based on how much Star worshiped this woman. Uh, if it turns out that Mina is indeed just, you know, another cuckoo pants basically out there, and there's nothing really special about her whatsoever, that she's not this great hero of Moody. In fact, maybe, maybe Mina Loveberry is just essentially a Don Quixote type character. And if so, that would be really sad. Uh, I definitely hope we do see more of her so that we could find out. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not right, but I'd definitely like to know. And I think her character could be made a bit richer. So while the episode was kind of dumb and we saw Star doing some crazy things, I'm going to give the show the benefit of the doubt based on the theory I came up with. And I'm going to allow Star to have done some dumb things in this episode purely out of hero worship. Also, because the writing in the next three episodes is so much significantly better, uh, we have uh, a need to review Camping Trip. Uh, probably tomorrow I'm going to do that since I'm so far behind. Uh, Camping Trip got a big thumbs up for me, and I'm certainly going to go into the details why. Then we also had On the Job and, I'm sorry, we had a Star Sitting and On the Job, uh, the two episodes that go hand in hand. And they are absolutely the best thing we've gotten out of season two so far. Uh, so we are moving in the right direction, and I'd like to think that bumps in the road like Star City could actually end up being more important than they appear to be. And uh, until proven otherwise, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt, because despite all my railing about the show for many of these uh, reviews I've done for this season, I like the show, honestly. I, I really hated what was being done to it, and... Uh, it looks like they are moving in a better direction with it from where it was at the start of season two. So that's a good thing. But I, I record these videos because I care, uh, because the characters are important to me, because it's something I really enjoy. And I would hate to see a show that I really thought was great with season one just turn into something that I can no longer recommend to people. And it was really in danger of going that way. And um, I'm really happy to be able to say that the episodes seem to be getting better, and I hope they keep moving in that direction. And I hope that I'm at least in some way, shape, or form right about Mina. I, I certainly could be all wet on some of the details. I, uh, I don't have any kind of inside track. Nobody on the show talks to me or anything like that. And I have no problem with being totally wrong about that. But I, I'd like to be wrong for the right reason, maybe have my details about heinous or whatever wrong, but still ultimately uh, be proven right that Mina's an important character. So we'll certainly see what happens on that front, but uh, I'm glad that Mina is in the show, as long as she is made to be a better character. Uh, certainly I don't want to start seeing her in every episode, but uh, I, I think she could definitely end up contributing something, and uh, I hope that that is going to be the case, and I really hope that the writing continues to improve. Uh, the only other thing I want to bring up about this episode is something about Star herself, and uh, we see her borderline obsessed with the dumpster diving, waiting for stale donuts to be thrown out and stale baguettes and other things. This is an odd habit for a princess to have. I mean, as a princess, she's royalty. She should be able to get whatever food she wants, and it should be pretty decent quality. Now, again, we were I was saying that Muni is primitive, and that's true. 
But I'm not sure where Starr's habit of hiding in dumpsters comes from. But uh, what I'm hypothesizing on this is it's part of her natural survival instincts. Uh, we know from Camping Trip that she is, uh, was out, to be out in the woods with no real food source, hunting down mo monsters, uh, apparently without any clothes either, not, and no shelter, and of course she didn't have her magic wand back then. Uh, we also know that she went on many adventures by herself and with Ponyhead, she'd fight monsters, she would tame wild unicorns. Uh, so being out in the wild, scavenging food out of garbage might have been something that she's more or less always done. Uh, so it's something that carries over on on Earth. She still continues uh, to do that because at heart she's a survivor and that's what she does. So I, I certainly hope that that's the case and it's not just a quirk about Star that she likes to eat out of dumpsters. Because it's just kind of weird. It's It's not even really like a funny or humorous thing we could say about her character. It's just odd and a little bit off-putting. Uh, but again, a benefit of the doubt I'm willing to give until proven otherwise, uh, based on the things I've just been saying for the last minute or so. So that's what I have for Starstruck. Uh, it's it's not a terrible episode if you look at it a different way and look at it as potential. If it turns out the episode is just going to fall flat and be about an absolutely insane character that comes to Echo Creek because reasons and Star follows her around because hero worshipping reasons, I would have to say... Uh, then that it's probably one of the worst episodes of season two so far. But until uh, it's shown to that, that to be the case and not be deeper as I've hypothesized, I'm willing to give it that benefit of the doubt and uh, give it a higher weighting and say it's one of the better ones, at least for now. So I'm going to leave it at that and we'll let the chips fall where they may and hope that season two continues to move in the right direction. Uh, so Tomorrow, most likely, we'll tackle uh, Camping Trip. I know that's a favorite of the season. Had lots of little Starco moments in it. And just lots of great character moments outside of uh, Simply Starco. And we're certainly going to talk about those. Uh, so until then, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate everyone who takes the time to listen to my opinion for 20 to 25 minutes about a, uh, a cartoon show because there are people out there who just don't care enough. And I know those of us into this, we're a small group, but uh, I feel that we're on to something and we are able to find a joy in shows like this that many people just aren't. So, you know, if you're one of those people, a big shout out to you. Thanks so much for wa for watching. Have yourselves a great night, and I'll be back soon with Camping Trip.